There's a thin layer that separates the three tiers of quarterback play in the NFL. It sometimes takes a moment to materialize and for the mirages to fade out into what they truly are, but since football is a game with the cruelest of gods, it seems only fair to divide these three levels into quarterback heaven, quarterback hell, and quarterback purgatory. The first two are pretty self-explanatory. There's the one where everyone's happy because the quarterback you drafted or signed is exactly what you want him to be. Then there's the exact opposite for those less fortunate, sometimes sinking deeper and deeper into the abyss each season that fans can no longer even see out of it anymore. But the third designation, quarterback purgatory, might be even sadder in its very own way. This level designates players that aren't good enough to consistently stack wins or compile playoff victories, but are still good enough at football's rarest position that you can't just cut ties with them, especially since more often than not, they keep the team afloat. Today, we're going to talk about a quarterback who's lived in that space for the first five seasons of his career, but now, it looks like we might have finally hit his judgment day. That man is of course Marcus Mariota, the latest Titans quarterback in a long line to be drafted with high expectations only to find himself on the bench in the end and the team right back to square one. Following the end of the Mariota tenure in Tennessee, there seems to be one prevailing idea when it comes to him, that he was never a good NFL quarterback and the Titans have wasted five years in figuring that fact out. So to get an honest look today, I want to take a look at the whole picture of Mariota's career thus far, why he's been in quarterback purgatory for the Titans, and why he's now found himself benched less than five full seasons after being drafted number two overall by the franchise back in 2015. But before we jump into what's gone wrong for the former Heisman winner, I'd like to take a second to thank this week's sponsor over at SeatGeek. Using my code SETTHEEDGE will get you $20 off of your first purchase on tickets to any live event, and they just rolled out a new program called The Daily Tap, where every single week SeatGeek is giving away thousands of dollars in tickets to events like Post Malone, The Jonas Brothers, and more. All it takes is the tap of a button to enter totally free of charge, and you can even enter every single day to continue to boost your chances. So head on over to SeatGeek to check out the daily tap and use my code SETTHEEDGE to get $20 off of your first purchase with them. So if we're going to evaluate Mariota from his first snap to his most recent with the Titans, let's jump back first to what Tennessee believed that they were getting in the first place with him. Coming out of Oregon, Mariota was a special prospect. Scouts always have a difficult time with quarterbacks that are outside the mold of typical pro-style QBs, so Mariota's pure athletic style in Chip Kelly's no-huddle, spread-option offense posed an interesting contrast to the other top quarterback prospect in Jameis Winston, a pure pocket passer coming out of a pro-style offense at FSU. While that raised questions about the easiness of reads within his scheme and his NFL readiness, Mariota brought accuracy and decent arm strength to the table coupled with crazy instinct, leadership, and a great ability to really protect the football and create his own plays when nothing else was there. These were all obviously huge pluses, and coupling that with how he carried himself off the field and with NFL scouts placed him at the top of a lot of people's draft boards. Though there were things to work on, Mariota's style had potential at the NFL level in the same way that a lot of dual threat talents find success, often with a coach that's able to build the offense around their developing strengths. At the time of the draft, though rumors whirled about whether or not teams would trade up to get Mariota, it wasn't a huge surprise when he was drafted second overall off the board by the Tennessee Titans. Now, just taking a cursory look at Mariota's career over his first five years in the league, there's not a lot to be wowed by necessarily, but not a lot to get up in arms over either. He had a career season in year two, putting up over 3,400 yards and 26 touchdowns in Mike Malarkey's first year as head coach for the Titans in their exotic smash mouth scheme, running an offense that was mostly archaic by modern standards, but took advantage of recent trends to carve out success. But it feels like since that point, Mariota has regressed down to a quarterback that's ranged from controlled at best to scared at worst, with his lowest lows hitting in the 2019 season that left him benched just six games in. So what's happened from when he entered the league as a supposedly electric talent to this point now where we're wondering if he'll ever even be a starter for an NFL franchise again? Well, the quarterback position is one of the most difficult things to evaluate in sports and for good reason. Not just because of the complexity of the job they do, but because of how much they depend on the infrastructure and players around them to give them an opportunity to succeed. 
So for this video, I think it's only fair we should look at both sides of the case for and against Marcus Mariota as an NFL quarterback. First and foremost, the case for. Let's talk about scheme and stability. I mentioned before that the best quarterbacks to come in and succeed at the NFL level with these dual threat capabilities have had offensive systems that allow them to take advantage of those skill sets. For instance, take coordinator Greg Roman and his different stints with the San Francisco 49ers and Colin Kaepernick, the Buffalo Bills with Tyrod Taylor, and now the Ravens offense with Lamar Jackson, all of which have made use of his quarterback strengths by utilizing the zone read, creative formations and personnel groupings, and even the same emphasis on the run game that the Titans have used for years. Even when looking at coaches with different overall philosophies, that principle of adaptability can be found even in someone like Bill O'Brien's use of Deshaun Watson, spreading out the field, utilizing more zone reads, and allowing him to make a quick adjustment from college into an NFL offense without limiting the dynamic ability that's quickly placed Watson on an MVP caliber trajectory. By contrast, let's look at the play callers of Mariota's career with Tennessee. Ken Wisenhunt was fired just seven games into Mariota's career and criticized for holding back both his development as a passer and limiting his ability to open up the defense as a runner. Mike Malarkey would take over, and that following offseason, he'd implement the aforementioned exotic Smash Mouth scheme alongside Terry Robisky. It was a name that turned out to be a lot more marketing than substance, but its basic premise was mixing modern usage of more shotgun and motion concepts to throw defenses off while still utilizing mostly power run concepts of old. It wasn't exactly a revolutionary idea, but it helped the Titans offense to find more success than they'd had in years, going 9-7 for two years straight, even including an insane comeback playoff victory in 2017. But while Mariota's numbers hit a peak in the 2016 season, 2017 really demonstrated how poor of a fit he was in that basic system. Despite all of the strengths he came into the league with, mobility, tempo, mastery of quick passing, the Titans forced difficult throws in condensed formations and didn't utilize play action anywhere near where they probably should have considering Mariota's effectiveness in it during that time. While the relative success of the Titans hid Mariota's lack of development as a quarterback, the following years wouldn't be able to hide that for much longer. Following a blowout playoff loss to the Patriots in 2017, Malarkey was fired and in walked Mike Vrabel with offensive coordinator Matt LaFleur in the offseason. 2018 saw even more struggles in Mariota's progression as a quarterback, despite LaFleur's aim to revitalize the team with elements of the revamped Rams offense. With inconsistency and continued injury problems marking another pedestrian season for Mariota and yet another offseason of questions regarding his future. As hindsight tells us here in 2019, LaFleur's departure and the team's move to Arthur Smith at offensive coordinator has made things even worse for the young signal caller, throwing only seven touchdowns in his first five games this year as a starter and throwing two interceptions en route to getting benched during a week six game against the Broncos. Now, there's plenty of factors here for both sides of the argument on whether or not Mariota is a good quarterback to be made. On one hand, he's failed to make significant strides as a passer and still struggles with weaknesses he entered the NFL with. But on the other hand, he's been saddled with four offensive coordinators, three head coaches, and three quarterbacks coaches through five seasons. There's not a lot of quarterbacks you expect to stagnate for this long, but there also isn't this amount of instability found in organizations that have dedicated themselves fully to a young quarterback usually. Not to mention how absolutely god-awful the Titans' play calling has been with Arthur Smith at the helm. I'm not even sure how well Tom Brady would do with that level of predictability. Then, on one hand, Mariota sustained a number of injuries and holds the ball for too long in the pocket. But also on the other hand, per Football Outsiders, his offensive line has ranked bottom four in pass protection for three of his five seasons as a starter, with the other two only placing them around the middle of the pack. So yes, there's a lot of blame to go around, but for as much as I believe Mariota has been dealt a mostly unfair hand in terms of coaching, play calling, weapons, and overall circumstance, that doesn't mean there still isn't legitimate reason to place the blame on Mariota's shoulders for his own lack of ability to reach his ceiling in the NFL. In contrast with the other hotly debated quarterback from the 2015 draft in Jameis Winston, who struggles with a Superman complex that results in both massive production and massive meltdowns, Mariota has played things safe for nearly his entire career. 
He's never really had elite level arm strength, and his tendency to doubt throws for even a split second at times has caused him to miss on easy completions and take sacks that an NFL QB has no business in taking. Not to mention, the constant inability for him to stay on the field hasn't helped either his ability to prove doubters wrong or his ability to continue to grow as a quarterback. Now, I'm not one to actively use health like it's something the player is in control of, and Mariota has by all accounts been as tough as they come, but with eight games missed in his career and constant problems hampering him over the course of seasons, it certainly hasn't helped his ability to continue to play at a higher level. Regardless of where you stand on whose fault it is for whichever aspect of the Titans and Mariota's lack of success, when you combine pretty lackluster metrics with the fact that his overall arm and pocket presence has improved little, if at all, since the sparks shown in his debut game, it's not hard to see why Tennessee is now standing at a crossroads. So what do they do? I mean, even with the struggles that led to his demotion in the 2019 season, at least among Titans fans, this seems to be a pretty difficult split issue. And I get that. There's been magical moments, there's been times that Mariota's felt like the future of not just the Titans, but the NFL. The faults obviously aren't all on Mariota. The Titans as an organization have failed him at just about every turn. But what often sets apart generational talents like Mariota was chalked up to be is their ability to overcome those shortcomings in their situation. And on that front, I'm not sure that we've seen anything to suggest that's who Mariota is. Mariota came into the league at a turning point for the inclusion of a lot of aspects of the college game. We see it now more than ever with the Andy Reid coaching tree, new chances taken on coaches like Cliff Kingsbury, hell, even Chip Kelly nearly traded the farm to move up and take Mariota for the Eagles at the time of the 2015 draft. But instead, he was drafted by the Titans to prove himself as a pocket passer in a regime that didn't necessarily embrace all aspects of his game and what it would take to translate them to the NFL level. And in the end, I think that prevented him from becoming something truly special in this league. As for what the future holds, it's really anyone's guess. Maybe he stays in Tennessee next year, maybe he doesn't, but at this stage of the game with him headed to year six in 2020, he looks to either be a low tier starter for a desperate franchise or one of the league's best backups. And for all we know right now, the right coach could get their hands on him and completely revitalize his career. Although there's not a clear path as to where or how that would even take place. So if you ask me about Marcus Mariota and his quick fall from grace into quarterback purgatory and now watching from the sidelines, it's just kinda sad. He seems like an incredible, genuine, hardworking guy who wasn't able to be a savior for a broken organization, and now looks to be the first to fall from what has turned out to be quite the roller coaster ride for the top two picks in the 2015 NFL Draft. But that doesn't mean we haven't seen players turn their careers upside down completely and find success after making the switch to a new franchise even when all hope seems lost. So in the end, a change of scenery might end up being bittersweet. But it's looking more and more like that could be what Marcus Mariota's career really depends on.